even the people who are on the cutting edge that even will treat it with testosterone and estrogen replacement, they typically aren't using the safest methods of practice in my opinion. What's up guys, Derek, more place, more ace.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about HRT for women and not really a deep dive into everything you need to know about it, but more so just a personal anecdote mixed with some clinical research that I feel is very applicable probably to your mom. <laughs> uh, that was funny how I said that. So my mom is 61 now and she has uh, had menopausal, symptoms she's been in menopause for almost 10 years now so she's had interrupted sleep she's constantly having hot flashes she is um it's not easy to stay in shape obviously when your testosterone and your estrogen are in the fucking toilet um and i had elaborate blood work done for her and fortunately now the fact that i have equity in a hrt clinic it affords me the flexibility to actually get doctors who know what the fuck they're talking about to take a look at her situation very seriously and you know sit down with them and go through her blood work a to z and get everything addressed properly by people who are on the cutting edge and aren't fucking morons who think that you're supposed to just deal with hot flashes and cardiovascular disease and alzheimer's so basically this is her protocol for now i'm going to explain why after so first thing is she takes a compounded five milligram DHEA, 25 milligram pregnenolone um, pill in the morning, then a hundred milligrams of progesterone oral before bed. She takes, this is a topical cream that she uses, two clicks of 24 milligrams per gram testosterone vanishing cream and two clicks of compounded 0.3 grams per gram estriol, three milligrams per gram estradiol, vanishing cream in the morning and at night. So that's two clicks of each of those in the morning and at night. So she, for a while now, has been having, you know, the run of the mill, exactly what you would expect from somebody in menopause, hot flashes, you know, hard to, uh, not what she was in terms of body composition wise, harder to stay in shape, um, shitty sleep, um, and in the gutter hormone levels to the point where you very much worry for their cardiovascular disease risk and neurodegenerative disease risk. And as somebody who is has strokes running in the family, her mom, my grandma, had a stroke um, in her, a bit older than my mom, but still, it's concerning. Like for somebody that, you know, it's one of the first things you hear is, don't do estrogen replacement therapy because it's going to give you a stroke. That's one of the things you hear all the time. And, Unfortunately, this is pervaded through uh, the fucking internet, the interwebs, the and especially all the doctors. Like I remember my mom, she went to a doctor's appointment, appointment with the family doctor a few years back or whatever. And the family doctor was also <laughs> having hot flashes herself. And she basically just said, yeah, you're fucked and you just gotta deal with it. As she sat there in the winter time in her sandals because of hot flashes. So the doctor, was miserable who was telling my mom you have to be miserable too because i don't know what the fuck i'm doing so obviously that's just unacceptable and it just reflects so poorly on the medical system nowadays where hormone replacement therapy is a very obscure niche area and um you know no doctors fucking touch it with a 10-foot pool because they have no idea what they're doing so basically what you need to know is when you hit menopause and the reason why this is relevant like we're all dudes watching this probably or the majority of us i guarantee based on my demographics it's highly likely that you have a mom who's perimenopause or is in menopause so that's why this is relevant and why i'm making this to begin with because it's very likely that you have somebody in your family who would benefit from hormone replacement therapy because otherwise when you're in menopause it's not like a dude where you just have slowly diminishing test levels as you get older it's like once you hit menopause your body's basically saying you're biologically worthless for reproduction at this point and get the fuck out of here and it's basically trying to kick you on to your grave essentially and it crushes your testosterone and estrogen to nearly nothing 
to the point where it's extremely cardio and neurotoxic. So as you probably already know, if you've seen my videos on, uh, you know, like testosterone's not neuroprotective, estrogen is and stuff like that, that a lot of the benefits of a lot of the ways that your heart and brain and body function rely on hormones, but also a lot of cardio and neuroprotective mechanisms are facilitated through these hormones too when otherwise if they're in the gutter the rate of disease risk goes through the fucking roof like when you see the heart disease risk for women pre-menopause and then post-menopause it's like colossal how much of a difference it is and it's you know it basically very plainly shows that i don't know if that's the right fucking word very blatantly shows how much of a cardio protective effect the estrogen actually has on the heart. So right when all of a sudden production drops to nothing, all of a sudden the heart disease risk sky skyrockets as well as um, Alzheimer's fucking outcomes and neurodegenerative disease outcomes. It's not a coincidence that all this happens right when you hit menopause, all of a sudden the disease risk goes to the roof. Now what's the problem is throughout, you know, the clinical data we've been led to believe that estrogen is going to increase your risk of clots, which can be problematic for somebody who's been dealing with cardiotoxicity for eight, nine, 10 years to the point where they may have some buildup in their cardiovascular system that may get exacerbated by in increasing the viscosity and thickness of the blood and in increasing the clotting factors and whatnot. So if you have somebody who has had compromised heart function and a buildup of what would otherwise contribute to heart disease, and then you introduce something that increases clotting factors on top of that, you can have kind of like a dynamite effect where, you know, in theory, you could actually cause cardiovascular complications by introducing estrogen replacement. The problem with that is, is the way they kind of describe it is there's this, it's almost like a, you have like a grace period, they say. They say after you hit menopause, you have 10 years um, off the top of my head, I believe it's 10 years where after that point, it's more dangerous for you to get on a hormone replacement than it is for you to just not and just accept that you've already fucked your heart basically, which is just unreal that this is <laughs> something that is uh, taught in medical, in the fucking medical industry. So I, you know, for me, my mom is like right on the borderline of that 10 year mark. And I was like, okay, like now that I actually am aware of this stuff and I have access to this clinic where I can actually leverage the medical intervention myself without having to subject her to stupid fucktard doctors locally, I actually get her proper help. And fortunately, I've done so much fucking research that I've come to realize that you can actually circumvent the cardiovascular risk to at least based on what I've seen. Don't take this as fact. This is what I've seen throughout my research itself. So first off, Obviously, I've already outlined that the main reason of doing this is not just like there's so many reasons to do this. It's not only quality of life, um, sleep quality, um, but you know, the main things are several organs in your body really rely on these hormones to function correctly and are otherwise in a compromised state of continuous essentially just toxicity until you actually attenuate the problem and introduce the proper hormones to facilitate the things that are supposed to be happening in an otherwise younger, healthier woman. So, and then on top of that, obviously just basic things like mood regulation, um, relaxation versus, you know, being able to uh, put on muscle versus, you know, being able to fucking get to sleep properly, not wake up 47 times. Um, just basic shit, you know, and the risk for disease goes through the fucking roof when you hit menopause to the point where to me, it seems like a no brainer for any woman personally, unless you want to die early, at least from what I've seen, or uh, maybe that's a bit too drastic of a statement, but experience lower quality of life for your years and very likely increase your risk of deleterious outcomes should you not intervene as soon as possible. So like if it were me and I could rewind time 10 years to the point where I was a younger teenager and I knew this shit, I would have told her this stuff when, um, but obviously I didn't know any of this stuff until recently. And frankly, every year I learned so much that I'm pretty much an idiot, like every year prior compared to what I am now. And I'll hopefully I'll look back on 
stuff that I've done, uh, you know, I don't want to say in a year, I'm going to look back and say I'm an idiot right now, but I'm learning constantly all the time. And some of this stuff is uh, fairly new to me, like the uh, risk associated with oral estrogen replacement as opposed to transdermal, which is what I'm going to be getting into now. So one thing I was digging into when I was digging into the estrogel data, when I was using exogenous estradiol for myself during my DECA only HRT experiment, I was digging into the different pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of exogenous hormone therapy for estrogen replacement. Now, one thing I found, which was super interesting, is that the one of the main issues to, there's a lot of issues that come with oral estrogen, one of them being that the ratio of estrone to estradiol in the body is thrown off significantly. However, when you administer estrogel, which is what I was using for my DECA only experiment, it increases serum estrone levels, but it produces a physiological ratio of estradiol to estrone rather than a disproportionately high level of estrone relative to estradiol to actually yield the amount of estradiol you want to get that physiological, um, you know, ER beta response that you're trying to get where you actually facilitate the neuro and cardio protection you're trying to get out of this stuff. So like ideally we don't want a disproportionately high estrone level just to get the neuro and cardio protection we're trying to get out of the estradiol. So with the estrogel or any other topical estrogen, bioidentical of course, this is consistent with physiological levels observed during the follicular phase of the normal menstrual cycle. And this is of a natural, young, vibrant female. So regardless of administration form, such as patch, gel, transdermal, estradiol is transported into the skin through the stratum corneum, epidermis, and dermis by a passive diffusion process. Following this, estradiol is then taken up by local capillary blood vessels and delivered into the circulation. There's a depot effect in the skin with transdermal estradiol, which results in continuous delivery of transdermal estradiol into the circulation throughout the day. This is because the skin functions as a semi-permeable membrane and there is a concentration gradient between the application site of the of transdermal estradiol and capillary blood. With the rate of diffusion of estradiol across the stratum corneum being the specific rate limiting factor in absorption. So as a result, peaks and troughs and circulating estradiol levels are limited, whereas with oral estradiol, you get this massive spike of disproportionate amounts of uh, estrone and just a ridiculously super, super physiological amount of estradiol too, which is not something that even resembles anything like natural endogenous production of a healthy young female. And the skin and subcutaneous fat act as a reservoir of estradiol that maintains circulating estradiol levels between doses. So for these reasons, transdermal estradiol can provide near constant circulating levels of estradiol, whereas oral estradiol cannot. Unlike oral estradiol, like I said, transdermal is not associated with super physiological concentrations of estrone um, or estrogen conjugates like estradiol sulfate and transdermal estradiol does not have a disproportionate effect on liver protein synthesis, which is a huge factor that needs to be taken into account here. So in accordance, topical estradiol at typical menopausal replacement dosages has been found to not increase the risk of blood clots or insulin resistance, nor to affect hepatic SHBG sex hormone binding globulin. Globulin, as you've seen in some of the uh, birth control research and oral estrogen administration, SHBG goes through the roof, which binds up a significant amount of testosterone, which then inhibits free testosterone, which then can cause lower libido in women that are using combined oral contraceptives that don't have a progestin with enough androgenicity to offset the drop in free testosterone and DHT levels. But with that being said, IGF-1 as well as G GHBP while simultaneously providing symptom relief. So transdermal does not do any of this shit, whereas oral does all this shit. It increases the risk of blood clots, insulin resistance, increases SHBG levels, which binds up free androgens, IGF-1, GHBP, all this shit, but it still provides the same symptom relief without fucking with any of this stuff. And in addition to that, oral estrogen replacement can cause a significant rise in C-reactive protein, which is the main inflammatory marker we use as a proxy for how much systemic inflammation you have in the body, how prone are you to disease, is largely dictated by 
is your C-reactive protein elevated? If so, that's a fucking bad sign overall. And the fact that oral spikes it, guess what doesn't spike it? Transdermal. And this may explain the increased risk of cardiovascular events that occurred in these clinical trials where they evaluated the safety outcomes and tolerability of estrogen replacement because it was using these oral administration methods. So this increase in C-reactive protein has been shown clinically to be avoided entirely by using transdermal estrogen instead, implicating a first pass hepatic effect that is responsible for the majority of the negatives that may come with oral estrogen replacement therapy that we are, you know, have uh, uh, permeated through the world of hormone replacement as a, you know, scare tactic, not a scare tactic, but like something that, uh, you know, has been told adamantly to us that is a high risk thing to be doing. And it's, you know, this is going to happen if you do this, when in reality, they have no idea the difference between how this stuff is actually circulated into the blood and gets circulated to target tissues. It has a big difference when it's transdermal versus orally ingested. So there are arguments too for oral ingestion, like how it increases HDL levels, which is something that should be touched on as well. And I'm going to be touching on now. So HDL levels increase more when you use oral estrogen versus transdermal. And this is where one of the arguments come. Like, first off, there's like progressive doctors who already, if they're even looking at estrogen replacement in general, like this is somebody who is on the cutting edge. Above and beyond the cutting edge though, the cutting edge of the cutting edge are the guys who understand that the spike in HDL from the oral estradiol is not necessarily indicative of a good thing. We have all these negative markers associated with oral estrogen ingestion. We already know it spikes inflammation with C-reactive protein. We already know it cranks SHBG through the roof. We know it has stress on the liver. We know it does all this shit with IGF-1, GHBP, and insulin resistance. We also know that blood clot risk goes much higher when you're on uh, oral estrogen versus on topical. You don't get any of the blood clot risk. So why, you know, but then we get the increased HDL from the oral. So shouldn't we be doing oral? And this is what I detailed probably a bit more briefly in my DECA replacement last year that I did or earlier in the year, whatever it was. Um, and my kind of, I did a bit of a mini deep dive into transdermal versus oral estrogen at that time, but this is going to be the icing on the cake on that. So I already outlined all the negatives associated with it and how you can avoid those by using transdermal, but we see the increase in HDL. So there's the argument for oral, you know, it increases your lipid, your lipid profile improves on oral, but it doesn't on transdermal nearly as much. So doesn't that make oral potentially a more efficacious alternative? You know, this is something I see as a major misinterpretation of the data personally. So this is the study I'm going to be referring to. Contrasting effects of oral versus transdermal estrogen on serum amyloid A, SAA, and high density lipoprotein SAA in postmenopausal women. So consider here, serum amyloid A. What do we know from that? It's an acute phase protein that determines long-term cardiovascular prognosis in women. Like CRP, SAA is produced by the liver and has been shown to directly promote atherosclerosis and vascular inflammation. Inflammation. So however, unlike CRP, C-reactive protein, which I already mentioned is the main inflammatory marker that we look at, SAA can form a complex with HDL, high density lipoprotein in the plasma and the elevated SAA content of the HDL particle, HDL SAA has been shown to interfere, not aid, but interfere with anti atherogenic atherogenic, antioxidative, and anti-inflammatory HDL function. So on paper, we look at the difference. Effects of oral versus transdermal estrogen administration on total SAA and SAA HDL. We can see here, baseline estradiol, 30 picograms per milliliter. Oral spikes it up to 172. Placebo, 31, stays about the same. Transdermal goes up to 151. We get symptom relief with transdermal. We get the same target endpoints we want with symptom relief for menopausal women. However, and we also mentioned, our, keep in mind we already have all the negatives associated with oral and all we're trying to do at this point is disprove the HDL hypothesis here. So HDL, we can see HDL, you know, good cholesterol. Baseline, 45.6 milligrams per deciliter. Oral spikes it up to 50.7. So we get a 
plus five milligram per deciliter increase in HDL levels with oral that we don't get with transdermal. With the transdermal group though, they only go up by 0.6. So we had oral group went up by um, 5.1 milligrams per deciliter. Whereas with the um, transdermal, we go up by 0.6 milligrams per deciliter. So obviously not nearly as good of an improvement to our lipid profile, right? This is where you can look at APOA, all these other markers, but look at total SAA and HDL SAA. So here's our baselines. We have 5.3, micrograms per milliliter of total SAA baseline. When you take oral, that goes up to 6.51. When you take transdermal though, it goes down to 4.04. .04. Remember what SAA is. It is produced by the liver and has been shown to directly promote atherosclerosis and vascular inflammation. In addition, what's it do? It forms a complex with HDL that, called HDL SAA, which interferes with anti-atherogenic, why can't I say that word? anti-atherogenic, antioxidative, and anti-inflammatory HDL function. So we basically have a complex of HDL and SAA that's rendering the HDL unable to do what it's supposed to be doing essentially in layman's terms. So just because your HDL is going up, you have this SAA spiking up, which is forming a complex that is inhibiting the HDL from doing what it's supposed to do. So here we see the HDL SAA complex, micrograms per milliliter. 3.71 baseline. After oral, this spikes up to 4.18. What happens on transdermal? Goes down to 2.7. So, and we also have our, two, we have our total SAA decrease from 5.3 to 4.04 .04 on transdermal, whereas on oral, it spikes up another 1.21 micrograms per milliliter. So we basically have not only this fucking shitty <laughs> promotion, this, this other thing produced by the liver that promotes atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis and vascular inflammation on top of all the other shit I already mentioned, but it's also binding to the HDL and inhibiting it from doing what it's supposed to do. So this increase in HDL, we can actually see in the discussion at the end, we can see here, overall serum levels of total SAA and HDL SAA during transdermal estrogen replacement therapy were 35% lower than those during oral estrogen replacement therapy. And we skip to the end of the discussion here. We see oral estrogen replacement therapy is thought to have an advantage over transdermal estrogen replacement with regards to a more favorable lipid profile, particularly higher HDL levels. Despite this favorable effect of oral estrogen replacement therapy on HDL, large randomized studies failed to demonstrate that oral estrogen replacement therapy had any impact on progression or regression of coronary or carotid atherosclerosis and even increased risks of stroke and myocardial infarction. So this is where we get the oral estrogen spiking the blood clot risk and blah, 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 as well as all the other fucking shitty things it does. In this regard, reduced HDL SAA during transdermal estrogen replacement therapy may augment HDL function even if HDL levels were unchanged. So this basically is saying the transdermal method, even though HDL levels aren't going up like they are with oral, the level of SAA going down is far more beneficial and outweighing any kind of minimal, any kind of increase you get in HDL is completely negated and superseded by this negative effect on the HDL SAA complex and the spike in SAA, as well, as well as all the other fucking things I mentioned already, the clotting factors, the everything. Furthermore, recent studies have also indicated that oral estrogen replacement therapy increased risk of dementia. SAA is a precursor of amyloid fibril, which is found to deposit in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease, promoting chronic neuronal inflammation and neuronal loss. Whether chronic elevation in SAA during oral estrogen replacement therapy will lead to deposition of amyloid fibrils in brain tissue and contribute to development of dementia also remains unknown. Large prospective studies are needed to determine whether the anti-inflammatory effect of transdermal estrogen replacement therapy will constitute an effective strategy for preventing atherosclerosis without increasing the risk of dementia after menopause. So basically, transdermal essentially circumvents any of the risk associated with oral replacement. Based on what I've seen, that is what led me to use it for my DECA only experiment and is also what led me to my conclusion on how to treat my mom. So my the blood clot thing, my grandma had a stroke and she 
you know, can't really uh, communicate that well now. She had a stroke that was devastating to her quality of life and to the fe- to the point that she can no longer speak properly. So obviously I didn't want to see the same thing happen to my mom. And the fact that she was almost 10 years deep into menopause, suffering body composition, not spending enough time on self-care, um, poor sleep quality, which is like one of the main things that you need to prevent cancer and uh, heart disease. Um, you know, waking up all the time from hot flashes. It was just a bad fucking bad combination. So I need to get this address as fast as possible because it's not like you're doing anything smart by, you know, at the 10 year mark where they say, oh, it's too risky to get on estrogen replacement at this point. You're better off not doing it. It's them basically saying your increase in clotting factor risk from taking oral estrogen replacement is going to supersede whatever potential benefit you could get from it because you waited too long. So this was like key to get addressed ASAP to make sure her cardiovascular disease risk is no longer being exacerbated, nor is her neurodegenerative disease risk. But then on top of that, now she can actually get enough testosterone and keep, remember I said at the start of the video, she's going testosterone replacement too. It's at a physiological dose for women though. Like you don't just get your estrogen crushed into the ground. Your testosterone is also in the fucking gutter when you're a female. So she's on progesterone, testosterone, and estradiol. So now she's in a position where her hormonal environment allows her to not only actually build muscle and lose fat again. So for the first time in like, I don't know, like 15, 20 years or something, she's fit into a pair of shorts that she hasn't fit into since I was like a little kid. I remember there's this picture of me in Disneyland with her and she's in these shorts and she said she hasn't been able to fit into them since that trip, which was when I was a little kid. So the fact that she's in a position now hormonally that is conducive to her actually being able to get to a body composition that's healthier. And then on top of that, just inherently, the cardiovascular, cardio protection, neural protection you get from having adequate hormones present. On top of that, the fact that she's no longer having hot flashes and she's been having hot flashes for like almost a decade now, but she's no longer having them and her sleep quality, she's not waking up all the time. She's getting good quality sleep, no hot flashes, quality of life is through the roof. Everything is just so improved that I felt like it was absolutely worth making a video on this because above and beyond just our own needs for hormone optimization and what we're interested in, above and beyond that, like think about your mom, dude, or your dad too for HRT. Moms in particular though, once they hit menopause, it's like many things get fucking crushed into the ground. And for guys, obviously, you know, you'd be deficient. You're going to have poor outcomes as well in cardiovascular disease risk and whatnot. But it's a slower drag as opposed to women. All of a sudden, it's like biology just like that. All of a sudden, you, your perimenopause to postmenopausal like shift can be extremely quick to the point where, you know, one day, I'm not trying to say one day, all of a sudden, everything just like turns off. But I mean you literally go to fucking nothing. It's not like a dude where you can function with like, you know, you can have like a semi-decent testosterone level for many years, but once you hit menopause, like you're fucked. Like you're, you're pretty much like biologically useless according to your body and it's trying to dispose of you. Or I don't know if that's the mechanism by which it's doing it, but it certainly does not want you to be healthy at that point. So, you know, if you want to live a longer, healthier life and have a higher quality of life, hormone replacement, I feel like is absolutely like, even more warranted potentially for women than for men. It's just a more misunderstood concept. And even the people who are on the cutting edge that even will treat it with testosterone and estrogen replacement, they typically aren't using the safest methods of practice in my opinion. And that's where I kind of, um, my research really intertwined with uh, my HRT clinic and their expertise and we devised this protocol for my mom that I feel like just hit all the proper angles. You know, she has, uh, you know, the strokes run in the family. She uh, was worried about the blood clots. Obviously I'm worried about her getting blood clots, starting estrogen replacement. So all my research into this bodybuilding shit, into like my weird hair loss replacement, <laughs> my weird hair loss content and stuff all tied in and, you know, helped me figure this out. Cause I wouldn't have known about the difference between the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of transdermal versus oral if I hadn't delved into this for myself over a year ago. So it was good to see this tie in. It was perfect timing with me getting the equity in the clinic and whatnot and devising this protocol for her. And it's great to see the significant change already. Like it's only been a few weeks and she's already like, way better, way better. And I'm no longer worried about her walking around with like a fucking 
single digit estradiol level and like trash testosterone levels to the point where you're literally walking around with like a toxic heart that's just like slowly destroying itself with no fucking vasodilation or anything going on that's supposed to protect it. So, and your brain's just getting devastated. Anyways, if you're like me and you have a mom who's in menopause and you want her to live a long, healthy life with a high quality of life, I highly encourage you to reach out to my HRT clinic, at least get in touch with them for a free consultation, have the, have her get in touch with them. You can get $50 off your first treatment with the coupon code MPMD50. And um, look at this shit seriously, because it's not like, I think a lot of poor outcomes in a health context for women could be averted by addressing this in the perimenopause phase as opposed to the longer you wait, the worse it's gonna get. And walking around with zero estrogen, zero testosterone is fucking terrible for you. So take from that what you will. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe if you wanna check out my clinic. Link in description below. Follow me on Instagram. I'm about to fucking sneeze again. Ah. <laughs> Excuse me. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more It's Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. Um, anything else I'm associated with you want to support, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.